Welcome to the Federalist Society's virtual event. This afternoon, March 3rd, 2022, we discuss switchbacks at the DOJ, the Sessions, Brand, and Garland memos. My name is Ryan Lacey, and I'm an Assistant Director of Practice Groups at the Federalist Society. As always, please note that the expressions of opinions are those of our experts on today's call. Today, we are fortunate to have an excellent panel, panel moderated by Beth Williams, who I'll introduce very briefly. Beth Williams is a board member at the United States Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board. Prior to her board service, Ms. Williams was the Assistant Attorney General for the Office of Legal Policy at the United States Department of Justice. Williams graduated from Harvard College magna cum laude with a degree in history and literature, and she earned her law degree from Harvard Law School, where she served as executive editor of the Harvard Journal for Law and Public Policy. After our speakers give their opening remarks, we will turn to you, the audience, for questions. If you have a question, please enter it into the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, and we will hand you questions as we, as we can towards the end of the, today's program. With that, thank you for being with us today. Ms. Williams, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, and thank you, Ryan. It's so nice to be here with you today and with the Federalist Society to discuss this important topic, the Sessions, Brand, and Garland memos, and the state of regulatory reform. And it is not only our distinguished panelists today who think this topic is important. As one of President Biden's very first actions in office on January 20th, 2021, he issued Executive Order 13992, which revoked most, if not all, of the regulatory reform measures taken by the prior administration. As an explanation for this revocation, President Biden stated that it is the policy of his administration to, quote, use available tools to confront the urgent challenges facing the nation, including the COVID-19 pandemic, economic recovery, racial justice, and climate change. The order continues, this order revokes harmful policies and directives that threaten to frustrate the federal government's ability to confront these problems and empowers agencies to use appropriate regulatory tools to achieve these goals. In line with this executive order, Attorney General Merrick Garland on July 1st, 2021, rescinded two key memos that were part of the Trump administration's stated regulatory reform agenda at the Department of Justice. The Sessions memo, which prohibited DOJ components from issuing guidance documents that effectively bound the public without undergoing notice and comment rulemaking, and the Brand Memo, which prohibited the department from using non-compliance with DOJ's or other agencies' non-binding guidance documents as a basis for affirmative civil enforcement actions. Calling the procedures laid out in the Sessions and Brand Memos overly restrictive, Attorney General Garland replaced these memos with the Garland Memo, which largely makes it easier for the department to issue guidance and to rely on its own or other agencies' guidance documents in enforcement actions. So to talk about what actually happened and the implications of this, we have two incredible speakers here today with firsthand knowledge. First, I'd like to introduce Jesse Panuccio, who is a partner at Boyce, Schiller, and Flexner in both its Washington, D.C. and Fort Lauderdale offices. Jesse focuses on complex litigation and appeals and serves as the co-chair of the firm's appellate practice. He's also a public member of the Administrative Conference of the United States. Prior to joining Boyce Schiller, Jesse was the acting Associate Attorney General at the Department of Justice until 2019, where he oversaw the civil and criminal work of the antitrust, civil, civil rights, environment and natural resources, and tax divisions, and served as the chair of DOJ's Regulatory Reform Task Force. Before that, Jesse served for three years as the Secretary of Florida's Labor, Economic Development, and Land Use Agency, the Florida Department of Economic Opportunity and he served as governor, now Senator Rick Scott's general counsel. Jesse is also a fellow at the Center for the Study of the Administrative State at the Scalia Law School at George Mason University, where he writes and speaks about administrative law. Next, we're delighted to have Chris Savis join us. Chris heads Sherrard, Rope, Voigt, and Harbison's Government Compliance and Investigations Group. He concentrates his practice in the areas of government investigations and litigation. He has extensive experience in False Claims Act matters involving allegations of healthcare and procurement fraud, white collar fraud investigations, and commercial litigation. Before joining the firm, Chris served nearly a decade as an assistant U.S. attorney in the Middle District of Tennessee, where he worked on incorporating some of the department's regulatory reform initiatives into the Justice Manual, which is used as a reference by department attorneys across the country. He has subsequently written on this topic for the ABA. In addition to his regular duties, Chris was the district's elder justice coordinator and international affairs coordinator. Chris earned his JD at Georgetown University Law Center. 
He serves as a hearing examiner for the Tennessee Board of Professional Responsibility. He's a member of the Tennessee Bar Association, where he had served as chair and vice chair of the federal practice sex section. He's a member of the Nashville Bar Association and chair of its historical committee. Chris is also a member of the American Health Law Association and the Healthcare Compliance Association. He's the past chair of the Board for Stars Nashville, a nonprofit focused on the social development of children in Tennessee schools. He's a board member and the board secretary of Autism Tennessee and has been an adjunct professor of law at Belmont University, where he taught pre-trial pre litigation. We'll start with some remarks by Jesse and Chris, followed by some questions. As a reminder, if you have questions, please use the Q&A function to submit them, and we'll try to get to as many as possible. Jesse, why don't you begin? Well, thanks very much, uh, Beth. Thanks to Ryan as well. Uh, Beth, it's always a, a pleasure to be with you uh, and to be reunited again here. Serving with you at DOJ was one of the the great privileges of my career thus far. So good to see you here uh, virtually and congratulations on your uh, recent appointment. Uh, and Chris, nice to join you as well. Uh, privilege to be with you, look forward to this discussion. And finally, thanks to the Federalist Society. Uh, you know, I just looked up today when I was getting the link for this, uh, I thought it'd be easy to find today's event and they have so many events going that you actually have to scroll to the second page just for the events today. So thanks to the Federalist Society for all they do to make sure we're having important discussions about uh, timely topics across the country in law schools and in lawyers chapters everywhere. So uh, I'll get into it here. Our topic today is DOJ's approach to guidance documents. And I guess more generally, uh, the, the federal executive branch's approach to the use and enforcement of guidance documents. Uh, let me begin as I often do when I discuss regular, regulatory reform topics uh, with some first principles. Uh, James Madison famously lamented in Federalist 51 that men are not angels, and thus we need a government. And he explained after that, uh, quote, in framing a government which is to be administered by men over men, the great difficulty lies in this. You must first enable the government to control the governed. And in the next place, you must oblige it to control itself, end quote. Now, the framers accomplished this, accomplished this latter goal, obliging the government to control itself through the structural constitution with its carefully divided powers and its checks and balances. But to sum up several hundred years of American history in just a sentence or two, the administrative state has long since eviscerated most of those structural protections. And today, federal agencies, especially the Department of Justice, often wield the very unchecked, and uncontrolled power the framers feared would be destructive of individual liberty. And DOJ's seemingly limitless power was on full display and in the eyes of many like me, uh, was abused during the eight years of the Obama administration. Many of DOJ's practices looked a lot like legislating new law rather than enforcing existing law. Examples included the use of sprawling consent decrees to impose requirements on state and local governments, the use of third party payments and settlements to fund administration priorities that Congress had explicitly refused to fund and enforcement of statements of agency policy that had not gone through congressional lawmaking or APA notice and comment rulemaking. In short, DOJ was not in Madison's word, words controlling itself. It was in many ways exercising legislative and executive power and because many parties settle with DOJ rather than risk heavier penalties at trial, DOJ was also easily avoiding the meaningful check of judicial power. So when we arrived at DOJ in 2017, one of our goals was to implement strong regulatory reform policy and to return DOJ to its core mission of enforcing existing law rather than making new law. Our goal was the same as Madison's, to oblige the department and the executive branch to control itself. We put in place policies to guide and constrain the use of consent decrees, third party payments, and as relevant here, the use of guidance documents. Now, what is a guidance document? It is variously defined, but in short, it's an agency statement of policy or interpretation that has future effect on regulated parties, that is parties outside of the Department of Justice or the agency at issue, uh, the public. 
These statements do not go through the lawmaking process established by the Constitution, that is bicameralism and presentment in the Congress and with the president. And they do not go through the rulemaking process established by the Administrative Procedure Act. Instead, agencies simply announce these rules, these policies, in whatever form and whatever and at whatever time they please. During the Obama administration, for example, we often had government, what some people called government by blog posts, in which an agency would simply post a blog with some important new policy that would then govern the general public. Guidance documents have thus rightly been deemed sub-regulatory guidance or sub-regulatory policy, or even with the moniker regulatory dark matter. So what did the Sessions DOJ do to control itself in the use of guidance documents? First, Attorney General Sessions issued his memo of November 16, 2017, which clearly stated the principle that, quote, guidance may not be used as a substitute for rulemaking and may not be used to impose new requirements on entities outside the executive branch, end quote. The memo established that DOJ may not issue guidance documents that purport to create rights or obligations binding on persons or entities outside the executive branch. Next, two months later, on January 25th, 2018, Associate Attorney General Rachel Brand issued a memo that further implemented the principles of the November 2017 memo. That January 2018 memo established, quote, that the department may not use its enforcement authority to, effect, to effectively convert agency guidance documents into binding rules, end quote. In other words, the November 2017 memo dealt with the department's issuance of guidance documents, and the January 2018 memo dealt with DOJ's use of and reliance on and enforcement of other agencies' guidance documents. Over the next two years, the principles and policies announced in these memos on guidance were added to the Justice Manual, that is the centralized manual that controls all department attorneys and sets policy for all department attorneys. And they were also added to the department's regulations in the CFR, the Code of Federal Regulations. And this is an important point. I remember when I arrived at the Department of Justice, I would ask why certain things were done in a certain way. And people who had been there a while, career officials and, and even political officials with prior experience would say, oh, that's from the Delery memo or the Yates memo or the Holder memo or pick your officials. Sometimes it was even officials I had never heard of before and there was a memo with their name on it. Uh, so I once asked after hearing that some policy I was interested in or you know, something was being done in a certain way, somebody said, oh, that's a, the Delery memo. So I asked our staff, I said, would you please collect all of the associate AG memos that were issued during the last administration? Uh, I said, find them all. Let's just see what they were. Uh, it couldn't be done. Nobody could locate all of these memos. There was no central repository. Uh, and that meant there was no place where the public, much less the third ranking official at the Department of Justice, could actually go to find what policies governed the things the Department of Justice does. Uh, now, as a quick aside, there's a reason why DOJ officials like to put their names on memos. Uh, it's very marketable when you get to private practice. If you don't believe me, just go look at some law firm files of former officials and even officials who were tangentially involved, and you will see the names of many of these memos. But that's an aside. In any event, one of the good reforms that Deputy Attorney General Rosenstein put in place was to insist that all department policy from all memos be formalized and centralized in the justice manual and in department regulations. After all, if you are obliging the government to control itself, the policies that implement that control should be public, accessible, and transparent. These uh, larger efforts to, to step back and talk about the, uh, the, the, the issue of guidance documents, the, uh, the efforts at regulatory reform at DOJ were also mirrored at other agencies, and a lot of them were appropriately der derived from executive orders that the president had promulgated. Uh, the Department of Transportation, for example, established excellent memos and policies uh, on the use of guidance, and we saw this in other agencies as well. And as I said, the president issued several executive orders on regulatory reform, including EO 13891 on October 9th, 2019 which set a rule for the entire executive branch, not just DOJ, that quote, agencies must treat guidance documents as non-binding, both in law 
and in practice. So with that background, that descriptive background of the Trump administration, we now get to the title of this teleforum, which is switchbacks, switchbacks at DOJ and, and more generally. Upon taking office, President Biden issued Executive Order 13992, which revoked Executive Order 13891 and other regulatory reform policies. President Biden declared that such policies were, quote, harmful and threatened to frustrate the federal government's ability to confront issues like the pandemic. President Biden announced that, quote, executive departments and agencies must be equipped with the flexibility to use robust regulatory action to address national priorities. In other words, to summarize that, the administrative state should be in control and not be constrained in any way. At DOJ, Attorney General Garland wasted no time in taking action to implement President Biden's executive order. He revoked the policies constraining the use of consent decrees, third party payments, and as relevant here, guidance documents. In his July 1st, 2021 memo, Attorney General Gar Garland revoked the Sessions and Brand memos to the extent that they, quote, changed the department's traditional approach to guidance documents by establishing new review and approval conditions and by placing additional restrictions and requirements on both publishing and relying on agency guidance. Attorney General Garland instructed that department attorneys may use guidance documents uh, in affirmative enforcement cases, including when those documents may, in the department's judgment, be entitled to judicial deference. In other words, guidance documents can be used in court cases and enforcement actions to establish the law in cases of ambiguity. Attorney General Garland also instructed the department to revise the justice manual accordingly. And indeed, the section on the manual placing guardrails on the use of guidance documents has now disappeared from the manual. Furthermore, also on July 1st, Attorney General Gar Garland signed an interim final rule revoking DOJ's prior rule on guidance document reform. In the preamble to the rule, the department stated it would no longer codify policies like this in regulations. Quote, going forward, the department's approach to those matters will be governed by memoranda. Again, memoranda with various officials' names on it, not collected in any kind of central repository. So that's the descriptive background. Now let me make just a few uh, descriptive, uh, prescriptive points before I turn it over to Chris. First, in the policies adopted by the Sessions DOJ and the Garland DOJ and in the Trump and Biden executive orders, you see two very different views of the role of government and the rule of law. The Biden Garland view is that the administrative state is the government. It is and must be empowered to take action on any issue at any time, in any manner, the administrative state deems necessary. The view that the Sessions DOJ adopted was that constitutional guardrails still matter for preserving liberty, that good government, liberty preserving government must be checked by separated powers and importantly, by self restraint, by controlling itself. Second, I should note that the descriptive historical points I offered in the first several minutes of my comments make the path to regulatory reform in the sessions and bar DOJs seem very linear and straightforward. But of course, real life was a lot messier. As soon as the sessions and brand memos were announced, along with other regulatory reform policies, there was indeed resistance, both from career officials and political appointees who did not uh, like change, uh, did not like uh, any uh, upsetting of the traditional uh, ways of doing things, and frankly, did not want their own power checked in any way, because of course, being able to do what you want often makes your job easier. And when you are wearing the white hat and prosecuting bad guys and doing other important things, it often is expedient and easy to say that uh, self-imposed controls simply get in the way. Thus, during the process of reducing the sessions and brand memos down to justice manual and CFR regulations, for example, there were many internal skirmishes and efforts to chip away at the principles those memos laid down. Sometimes those efforts uh, were defeated and sometimes they prevailed, but I still think the justice manual and CFR regs came out pretty well before Attorney General Garland 
eviscerated them. Another struggle uh, at regulatory reform was over the position the department took in the Supreme Court case in Kaiser versus Wilkie in 2019, which decided the future of our deference. That is judicial deference to agency interpretations of agency rules. My position and that of many other reg reformers in the department was that support for our deference was simply incompatible with the principles announced in the sessions and brand memos. Unfortunately, that view did not prevail and the, the Solicitor General's office filed a brief supporting the continuation of our deference in the Kaiser case. And that of course is the position the Supreme Court ultimately took and our deference lives on, unfortunately in my view to this day. Finally, I'll note that efforts of the regulatory reformers in the Trump administration faced significant headwinds when the pandemic hit. The temptation for many officials, including political appointees, was to revert to the expediency of agencies being able to make up the law as they go. One need only look at the Treasury Department's ever-changing question and answer document on the PPP loans to see that phenomenon in action. And then of course came the election of President Biden and the reemergence of what I would call the administrative statists, such that these principles never really had the opportunity to take full root. But hopefully they provide a template for a future reform-minded administration to look to once in power. Thanks very much. And Chris, I look forward to hearing your comments. Thanks so much, Jesse. And I know we all are sad that we missed the Pinuccio memo. Uh, so maybe the next go round, I'll get one after you. Um, so turn it over to uh, Chris now for his remarks. Uh, thank you very much, and, and thanks to the Federalist Society for uh, for inviting me to this. It's a it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, just to to reiterate a little background on me, so so everyone understands where I'm coming from with these topics. Uh, I was an assistant United States attorney uh, in the Middle District of Tennessee uh, from 2011 through December 2019. As such, I am significantly outranked uh, on this particular panel, um, and uh, I will I will try to be interesting in spite of that. Um, and obviously my views are my own and don't reflect the position of the department then or now. Um, I was focused on affirmative civil enforcement, uh, so otherwise known as ACE, which is particularly healthcare and procurement fraud. Um, I was there when both the sessions and the brand memos issued. Uh, given my role uh, on the line as an AUSA doing False Claims Act cases, my focus was primarily uh, on the brand memo, though obviously I, I read and was familiar with both. Um, while I was in AUSA, uh, uh, I took part in a number of discussions regarding the brand memo and played a role in drafting the provisions of the justice manual that Jesse alluded to uh, pertaining to the brand memo that DOJ opt uh, adopted a few months later. Uh, from that background, uh, I can talk about my view on these memos, which is probably going to be a little more micro um, than what, what Jesse uh, stated. I'm looking at this more from the position of a, of a line prosecutor. Uh, in civil cases mostly. Um, and to me, the question of what kind of change the Garland memo will bring in that context uh, depends on a couple of things. Um, first, it depends on the baseline that you're starting from. Uh, for example, in the, in the ACE context, are we starting from a baseline of the original brand memo or are we starting from a baseline of the justice manual provisions uh, because they're not exactly the same or at least not are, are uh, at least arguably not the same, uh, even though both were um, enacted during uh, President Trump's administration. Um, the next question is what happens next? Um, what follows the Garland memo? Jesse alluded to regulatory provisions that are gone. The brand memo provision is gone. So I think what comes next is key. Um, but from, from my perspective, I think it's important to kind of go through, uh, like I said, on a maybe a bit more micro level and try to give a timeline of, of these documents and how they came uh, to be and, and what the difference was between them. Um, so as Jesse noted, the Sessions memo was first. Uh, I won't rehash hash too much on that. Basically stood for the principle that guidance that does not undergo the rulemaking process is not binding on parties outside of the executive branch. Um, DOJ should avoid circumventing the rulemaking process um, and should you know, identify guidance documents as guidance and disclaim that they have the force or effect of binding law. Uh, and make it clear that guidance contains recommended practices and would not, and the, and the guidance documents did not in and of themselves result in enforcement action. Um, that was the first step. And that was followed by, by the brand memo a couple of months later. Uh, and the brand memo addressed guidance documents 
specifically in the context of ACE cases. It was directed to uh, affirmative civil enforcement prosecutors, and it stated that uh, noncompliance with an agency document in itself, again, in and of itself, will not result in an enforcement action. Uh, it then arguably went a step further. Um, in the eyes of, of, of many uh, that I've spoken to, where it went on to say that department litigators may not use noncompliance with guidance documents as a basis for proving violations of applicable law in ACE cases. Um, the language a basis there as opposed to the basis is interesting and arguably where it goes a step further in that the Sessions memo talked about guidance documents not in and of themselves resulting in enforcement actions, whereas the brand memo seemed a bit more restrict restrictive in saying that they could not be a basis for enforcement actions. Um, the brand memo went on to say that the department may continue to use agency guidance documents for proper purposes, but it only provided one example of a proper purpose. Uh, it stated that where a document uh, simply explained or paraphrased the statute or regulation, uh, then the document could be used by the department in order to show that the party had the requisite knowledge for say a False Claims Act violation. Um, there were a couple of limitations in the brand memo. Uh, one, it indicated that it applied only to future ACE actions brought by the department and to matters currently pending wherever practicable. Um, it, it, as Jesse alluded to, the, the policy was not in place particularly long, and so it's difficult to know what wherever practicable meant. Uh, the, the Kaiser case may be some kind of indication of that. Um, but uh, the memorandum also stated that it was an internal policy document that cannot be relied upon by any party in any civil or criminal matter. Um, a few months later, um, the justice manual provision uh, appeared. Uh, as Jesse indicated, uh, Deputy Attorney General Rosenstein um, uh, pursued uh, this project. It was a large scale revision of the former US Attorney's Manual. Um, my understanding from the line, much along um, the lines Jesse was talking about, was that the goal was um, to put DOJ policies like the brand memo and other memo memos into one easily accessible place uh, and limit the practice of memos flying around ad hoc. Uh, I can tell you personally, as a line AUSA, I loved that concept. I, <laughs> there were a number of memos, uh, frankly, and I, I'd like to think I'm well-informed with names that I had never heard of, was not familiar with. And, and you know, you'd, you'd get sent here, there, and everywhere, depending on what your situation was. So the idea of a justice manual always sounded wonderful to me. In fact, even before um, the, the DAG uh, pursued the project, I wondered why the U.S. Attorney's Manual was called the U.S. Attorney's Manual and not something like the Justice Manual. So there you go. Um, numerous individuals of justice, uh, including some on the Attorney General's Advisory Committee, uh, were tasked with incorporating the brand memo into the Justice Manual. Uh, and this is uh, how I got involved. And it eventually resulted in what was Section 1-20 on the limitation of the use of guidance documents in litigation. Uh, as I understand it, Section 1-20 went through significant review and revision, uh, involved numerous DOJ lawyers and U.S. attorneys, appointed U.S. attorneys. Um, and in the end, it restated the general legal policy statements of the sessions and the brand memos. Uh, but the Justice Manual provisions uh, stressed that there were legitimate uses for guidance documents in ACE cases. Uh, it stated that the department may continue to rely on agency guidance documents for purposes, including evidentiary purposes that are otherwise lawful and consistent with the federal rules of evidence that do not treat such documents as creating by themselves binding requirements that do not already exist by statute or regulation. Uh, the justice manual uh, provision expanded on this by giving a few examples. Um, you know, one example it provided was the one in the brand memo. You can use guidance to establish scienter or knowledge of a party with regard to the binding regulation or statute. Um, another was to, to stress that guidance documents can be probative evidence that a party has or has not satisfied professional or industry standards uh, of practice related to the binding statutory or regulatory requirements. So for example, again, from kind of a line perspective, opioids uh, were a major policy initiative of the Trump administration and remain a major initiative of DOJ today. Um, the, uh, the justice manual provisions pointed out that uh, certain guidance documents from HHS CMS uh, could demonstrate or be used as part of the evidence to demonstrate that a physician was not prescribing opioids with a legitimate medical purpose 
under the CFR provisions. Uh, more generally in healthcare, that same type of issue is relevant to uh, medically reasonable and necessary uh, practices in regard to a lot of Healthcare False Claims Act cases. Um, the memo also, or excuse me, not the memo, the manual also pointed out that compliance uh, with guidance was relevant uh, when a party had falsely certified that it would comply um, with a guidance document in a government contract, the contract there being, being the binding document and not the guidance itself. Um, the final version of the Justice Manual stated that it fully implements, clarifies, and supersedes prior department memoranda on this topic, which presumably from, from, from our point of view and on the line was the brand memo as it was the most recent um, and most uh, specific pronouncement um, on, uh, on this matter, particularly with regard to ACE cases. Um, fast forward three years and you get the Garland memo. Uh, the Garland memo again starts with the same basic premise that guidance documents do not have the force and effect of law and do not bind the public and are not treated as binding on the courts. Um, the departure from the sessions and brand memos structurally uh, begins with a statement of what guidance documents can do. Uh, Attorney General Garland uh, notes that they can advise the public on how an agency understands and is likely to, excuse me, to apply its binding law uh, and that they can compile legal requirements to make them more accessible to the public, uh, among other things. Uh, the memo then goes on to rescind the sessions and brand memos. Uh, it says, as, as Jesse alluded to, that they were too restrictive, uh, discouraged the development of valuable guidance, uh, and have generated collateral disputes that otherwise hampered department attorneys in conducting litigation. Uh, Attorney General Garland then instructed the department to initiate the process to revise the justice manual to be consistent with this memorandum. And, and as I'll get to in a bit, I think that's really the $64,000 question from a from ACE perspective in particular is, is what, what does that mean? Uh, with regard to the, the guidance that was in section 1-20. Uh, the Garland memo stated a series of principles for the use of guidance documents going forward, among them that DOJ guidance documents should be drafted with the recognition that they do not bind the public, uh, department guidance should be clear, transparent, and accessible to the public, and as it relates to litigation, the guidance documents are not the basis of a department action, but may be used in any appropriate and lawful circumstance including when it may be entitled to deference or carry persuasive weight. This is where the Kaiser um, uh, position uh, comes in. Uh, so what are the practical results of, of these documents to date? Uh, well, as far as the, the Garland memo goes, uh, the initial final rules for 20 CFR sections 50.26 and 50.27 have been revoked. Uh, DOJ described them as overly prescriptive, and DOJ noted that it received fewer than 10 substantive comments during the 30-day public comments period on those regulations. Um, section 1-19 of the Justice Manual, which I haven't referenced yet, is still there, uh, and it basically states, again, the legal precepts of the Sessions Memo. Uh, it states that agency guidance documents may not be used to substitute for regulation. And it states that department components may not issue guidance documents that purport to create uh, rights or obligations binding outside of the executive branch. Uh, while that is still there, uh, section 1-20 of the justice manual is gone. Uh, I took a look actually one day after, after uh, I, I was asked to do this panel and noticed that it had disappeared in its entirety. Um, that was the section that had, had clarified slash superseded whatever language we wanna use uh, the brand memo. So with that history, uh, again, maybe looking at a more micro level from my perspective uh, as a line attorney uh, when I was at DOJ, what kind of change does the Garland memo bring? Um, well, on guidance documents generally, the Garland memo uh, acknowledges and adopts the general legal principle set forth in the sessions and brand memos. The guidance documents do not create binding law in and of themselves. That does not change much in the sense that that general proposition that subregulatory guidance is not a replacement for statutes and regulations is consistent with the case law that was in place before the Garland memo was issued. Uh, a lot, of course, a lot is in, goes into the details of how that is used by DOJ and by other agencies, but the general legal principle uh, remains the same. Uh, that said, the Garland memo certainly changes the philosophical approach to guidance documents. Whereas the sessions and brand memos set a baseline of limitation on the use of guidance, the Garland memo seems to favor a more case-by-case -case approach uh, based on applicable law, 
including the application of our deference uh, as discussed in Kaiser, and seems to very much more take a discretionary approach to this. You know, we're, we're DOJ, we're lawyers, we will, we will look at this on a case-by-case basis, and we will uh, do the right thing uh, under the law for that case. Um, on the issuance of guidance documents in ACE litigation, which, which is more my focus, uh, I wrote an article a few months ago proposing that all of this, uh, particularly the back and forth over the brand memo and the justice manual provisions, turned out to be something of a tempest in a teapot as it related to ACE cases. Uh, that is a practical matter, nothing really changed from the pre-sessions memo practice, um, but that does depend in part on what exactly you're comparing, uh, where that baseline is. Uh, the Garland memo is certainly a departure in philosophy and overall approach from the, from the brand memo akin to its departure from the sessions memo. Uh, the brand memo certainly reads more restrictively uh, and arguably limited the use of guidance documents on an evidentiary level uh, beyond uh, the hour deference issue. Um, but the Garland memo does not seem to travel as far from the justice manual's former section 1-20 as it does from the brand memo. Uh, the justice manual adopted the legal framework of the sessions and brand memos, but described some specific instances where guidance documents had evidentiary value short of being binding law in and of themselves. Uh, the final provision indicated that it was a clarification of the brand memo. And if that's the case, maybe the leap from the brand memo as it would have been applied over time to the Garland memo is not quite as big as it may seem for most ACE cases. Uh, in other words, maybe the actual number of ACE cases that are actually gonna be affected by the difference between the Garland memo and the justice manual provisions of the brand memo, that, that number of cases may not be as large as one might think on the surface. Um, it's difficult to know because as, as Jesse indicated, the brand memo and the justice manual regulations were in place for a relatively short period of time. So there's some guesswork to be done here, uh, but maybe uh, the difference ultimately uh, akin to what Chief Justice Roberts argues in his hour concurrence um, is maybe, maybe, it, it, or excuse me, this Kaiser concurrence about our, maybe that difference isn't as big as it appears on the surface. Um, that said, um, again, from, an, from a line perspective, the brand memo did force attorneys at justice to, to look carefully at guidance documents and how they were using them in the context of their enforcement cases, particularly in the False Claims Act context. Uh, and making that analysis more of a focus for trial attorneys and line AUSAs may have significant practice effects for ACE investigations and ACE cases uh, going forward, even post Garland memo, uh, in my opinion. Um, I think again, though, what comes next is ultimately gonna answer the question of how important the Garland memo is in the context of civil enforcement cases. Um, what does section 1-20 get replaced with? Um, does the new justice manual provision set any limits? Um, is there a new justice provision manual at all, or does this just get dropped? And if this just gets dropped, then what real guidance is there? And maybe that actually may end up being the most important difference is that there are no written guideposts that are placed uh, and you basically end up with a situation where uh, the, the guidance at issue in any given case is looked at on a case-by-case -case basis uh, without a, a policy that is written in such a way um, that, um, that uh, it, there's some predictability there. Um, that may ultimately be the difference is that you end up in a situation where you're just looking at court law in any given case to determine what is admissible for what purpose. Well, thanks so much, Chris. And I think, you know, that last point is very well noted. The regulations that uh, the last Department of Justice put in were rescinded uh, recently, and they have not been replaced with anything. They were just rescinded. So it is an open question what will happen next. Jesse, I know uh, I'm going to give you a couple minutes to respond to Chris. And in your response, you know, I wonder if you could also um, address the Garland memo criticisms of the session and brand memo that Chris mentioned. First, that they're overly restrictive. Second, that they've discouraged the development of valuable guidance. And third, that they've generated uh, collateral disputes and otherwise hampered department attorneys when litigating cases. Um, what do you make of those criticisms? Well, thanks, Beth. And, and those were great comments, Chris, uh, and very helpful to, to add uh, sort of an on the ground perspective uh, from someone who had to actually uh, deal with and, and implement uh, policy changes. And that's true 
you know, of the sessions and brand memos, but also any changes and things that came before how this actually works out on the ground is an important point. And I think uh, I'll just add, you know, part of that process of going from the general principle stated in the brand memo to uh, policy that was going to be put in the justice manual, many of those examples, you know, that making clear when and how you can use a guidance document to show see enter, that's important work that that kind of uh, sort of washes out when you when you when you do a careful vetting and you talk through it and you come up with you know again what I said ultimately although I may have disagreed with with some things that were lost in particulars came up with a pretty good well vetted broadly agreed upon justice manual provision now, that's important work and that's the way good internal agency policy making should happen um, which. Uh, I'll get to that. That leads to the second point I wanted to make in response or an ampl amplification to what Chris said. But the first point is this, you know, Chris noted that the Garland rescission memo restates that guidance documents don't create binding law. But the question is whether that's, you know, that sort of airy statement of principle is actually going to be in, uh, implemented in a serious way. And of course, the rest of the Garland memo says the department should go back to the traditional way of relying on and using guidance documents, and it can specifically use guidance documents uh, in court, ask for judicial deference to guidance documents. What AG Garland is referring to there is our deference, and our deference, by definition, allows agencies to make law through guidance documents because a regulation is ambiguous, and the meaning of it needs to be decided by the court. And if the agency has interpreted the meaning in a guidance document and the court applies our deference, the court is saying, even if it's not the most reasonable or the best interpretation, we will defer to your pronouncement of the law that did not go through notice and comment rulemaking or congressional lawmaking for that matter. And so, you know, in practice, using our deference, using the agency's traditional view of guidance documents absolutely is relying on guidance documents to have binding effect of law, regardless of whether that statement is at the beginning of, of the Garland memo. So that's one point. My second point that I'll make is, and, and, and Beth, this goes to what you asked, which is what do I make of the criticisms in the Garland rescission memo of the prior memos? And the answer is not much, because look at what those criticisms are. They're sort of broad-based criticisms with no examples. Uh, they have no specificity. So whereas we had this process that Chris outlined, where multiple U.S. attorneys, career officials, line officials, the DAG's office, the associate's office, the AG's office went through a year-long process of refining and vetting and debating and you know, going back and forth on what would go into the justice manual, and you had these very particular, well-thought-out examples of when guidance could be used. The Garland memo doesn't go through any of that. It doesn't say what was wrong with any of those examples. It doesn't get particular, uh, you know, any particular critique about what was wrong with that process of debate and refinement. It just says broadly, well, it's too restrictive and it's it's hampered agency action. Uh, to me, when you get criticisms like that that have no specificity, uh, that are simply broad broadsides against the policy. It is some suggestion that the rescission or the new policy is not based in any well-founded or logical or rule of law principle. It is simply about asserting power. And that's what, again, I said this really boils down to two different visions of government. And at the end of the day, I think the Garland memo, the Biden uh, EO are really statements about the raw power that the administrative state ought to be able to exercise whenever wherever and however it wants. And then my third point would just be to comment on, on what uh, Chris says, said about, you know, how is this all gonna play out? What changes are really there? You know, in, in some ways it's too early to know. And in other ways, as I said in my comments, the principles of the sessions and brand memos and even what got into the justice manual in many ways did not have a long time to take root. You know, this takes years to get these policies to really play out in cases which unfold over years and the training of attorneys over years. And, you know, they were quickly gone almost as soon as they were in place with the election of President Biden. But if you wanna see how the Justice Department is going to go forward in using guidance, uh, one telling example will be, you know, these task force they've announced, these various task force and priorities on 
uh, pursuing pandemic fraud. Uh, let's see what these prosecutors say and rely on in those cases in terms of how they prove up the fraud. Are they relying on congressional statutes and actual agency rules? Or are they going to rely on that ever-changing you know, 45-page Q&A document that came out on the PPP loan program? I think that could be a very telling uh, example of, of the agency's position on guidance going forward. Beth, can I respond to one thing that, that Jesse said just, just briefly with regard to those um, the criticisms that the Garland memo levied, focusing on the third one, um, that they'd uh, generated collateral disputes, uh, the restrictions that uh, generated collateral disputes and otherwise hampered department attorneys in litigation. Um, I, I can provide at least one specific example of that. And again, this is that kind of ground level view, but you know, within, I don't know, maybe less than days, maybe hours, of the brand memo being issued, um, and I did not experience this personally with my cases, but I know and, and read articles and talked to people involved because I knew them and worked with them, uh, instances where, where uh, attorneys at DOJ were contacted uh, by attorneys who, despite the fact that the brand memo said, you know, look, this does not create substantive rights, this is an internal policy, it can't be cited by parties, where lawyers in False Claims Act investigations were raising their hands and going, hey, you know, you, you cited to us to this to this you know guidance document from HHS. You cannot use that at all for any purpose, basically. Um, you know, with the one exception of of Center, uh, under the language of the brand memo, and that actually got into situations where they went public, um, and uh, there was there were articles in Law 360 uh, highlighting these types of disputes. And so, in that sense, now whether you believe that type of hampering is justified or not is another question. But the hampering certainly was there. Um, one effect that had uh, was that it, again, kind of emphasized this this memo and and again, kind of got into, I think, a lot of uh, litigators heads, you know, in the department, uh, this framework of analyzing how you're using subregulatory guidance, which, like I said, I think is 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 something that's going to have some impact going forward, even after Garland. Um, but it also, I think, highlighted that, you know, as Jesse says, you can you can bicker here and there about some of the things that were in the justice manual provisions, but ultimately I agree that they were well thought out, well reasoned, and and very helpful moving forward in finding the right the right policy to use. And they but they were certainly at least in in sounding more expansive than the brand memo. And so going through that process up front as opposed to the issuance of the brand memo when it issued might have been useful to avoid that type of hampering of department attorneys in their litigation process. Um, I'd like to turn for a minute just to the transparency issue briefly. So the, as you may know, the uh, one of President Trump's executive orders established, required uh, each agency to set up guidance document public portals. And uh, the idea behind that was that if the agencies are going to be relying on these agency documents, guidance documents, then it should be available to the public and easily available to the public. So the Garland memo maintains the portal and it encourages department components to post their guidance on the portal, but it doesn't require them to post it. I think the exact quote was, in addition, whenever practicable, department components should continue posting materials to the department's online guidance portal. Um, the Trump administration has said, if it's not on the portal, we, you can't rely on it in litigation. The government will not be able to rely on anything that's not on the portal. So the question is, does the new policy give any meaningful incentive to ensure that there's fair public access to the guidance, kind of to the point that Jesse was making with regard to um, some of these memos floating around? Chris, you want to take that uh, first? Sure. I, I mean, again, I think it, it may be a little early to tell. Uh, we have to see if the if the regulations um, are, are replaced with anything. Um, the general policy statements in the Garland memos do, do seem to to support that type of transparency. There's that whenever practicable kind of hedge, um, but that wherever practicable type of hedge was also in the brand memo when it talked about you know cases currently pending uh, that may be affected by the brand memos policy when it was issued as opposed to future cases, and so. I don't see that that carve out in and of itself as particularly unique. Um, I think it just depends, um, you know, how it's actually done in practice moving forward. 
Um, you know, as, as I said before, I was thrilled when the justice manual was put together and, and everything was, was findable and accessible. Um, you know, and I was able to go online a few days ago and find out section one dash 20 was gone. So I, 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 I'm all in favor of the transparency. And I think on a, on a theoretical level, I'm guessing everyone would say that. I think it's it just, the proof's going to be in the pudding. Well, Beth, I guess my response would just be, why not make it mandatory for every guidance document? I mean, that's the way it was. What are they afraid of? What are they afraid of the public knowing? I mean, why not? If, if, the, if the guidance document is meant to bound the public, to bind the public, then why not ensure that in advance that document was thoroughly public, findable, indexed, uh, and therefore accountable? And, and this goes back to my general critique that uh, when you look at the actual criticism, criticisms, they're really broadsides because the principal being enunciated in the Biden executive order. And it's not shy about this. I mean, it is what the Biden executive order says, which is the federal government needs, like the federal uh, executive branch needs flexibility in all things, in all circumstances to be able to do whatever it wants, whenever it wants. And so we're not going to be troubled by any pesky requirement that in all instances, we need to be public with our guidance. Uh, and I think that's the, the basic uh, not a debate between Chris and I here, but a debate between what was going on in the Trump administration and what's going on now in the Biden administration. Thanks. So we've got a question from our audience, um, Jeffrey Wood, which is, is there much decisional law, SCOTUS or otherwise, on the legal status of guidance? As a tax specialist, I could see safe harbor provisions as analogous, but jurisprudentially, is guidance actually law? Guidance seems to be a way for law for lawmaker to try to have its cake and eat it too, apart from the APA separations of powers issue. You want to respond Jesse, to that? Jesse, you want to go ahead? I, I can take that one first if you want. So I think it depends, uh, you know, in what context you're talking about. So the the, the now uh, deleted justice manual provisions are a good example. Certainly, if you're showing C enter. There's plenty of case law that says a guidance document that points somebody to a law or regulation can be used to search the enter, but that doesn't turn the guidance document to law. That helps prove an element of a crime. Uh, but in terms of the guidance documents establishing uh, independent law, I mean, I you know, again, it depends what we're talking about. There's a lot of case law out there, but where this really crystallized recently was in the use of our deference and what the Kaiser case did. Uh, just to restate that, our deference says you, know, you have a law from Congress, then you have the ability of the agency to go through notice and comment rulemaking, which also becomes binding law. But sometimes that notice and comment rulemaking is itself ambiguous. And then the question is, you, know, you go to court and one side is saying it means X and the government is saying it means Y. Normally, when you have an ambiguous provision, the judge, the, you know, the judge decides, the judiciary decides what it means. But in the case of our deference, the judiciary says we are going to defer to the, the executive branch's interpretation of that ambiguity, you know, especially if it's in a guidance document. And to me, when you get to the heart of it, what does that mean? Is essentially giving the force of law to a guidance document. And so that's what the whole fight in Kaiser was about, both internally at DOJ and then ultimately at the Supreme Court. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I, I generally agree with the description. I mean, there's there's significant law out there um, admitting, you know, guidance documents uh, for evidentiary purposes along the lines of of what's in the what was in uh, the justice manual provision I, that 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 I don't think at least most of it wasn't particularly controversial. Um, you know, when it gets to to the point of of um of deference you know as a as a law as opposed to to evidentiary issues uh, i i don't presume to to sum it up better than than justices kagan and gorsuch did in, in kaiser um you know the the debate there about I, for lack of a better you know descriptor where to draw those lines um and as i alluded to in my initial comments you know i think chief justice roberts um, you know, has an interesting statement in his concurrence where he talks about um, the distance between those places, maybe not being as great as as one might think on the surface. I know I saw a comment pop up earlier that someone disagrees with that. And that's that's I mean, I'm sure Justice Gorsuch and Justice Kagan would disagree as well. Um, but but again, from my point of view on a, on a, on a kind of practical case by case, day by day, 
basis as a line of USA, I, I would tend to say that, that, that I agree with that at least to a degree. Um, you know, maybe it's just that, that, you know, at the risk of sounding corny, you know, we, we were told to do justice. We were in the justice department and, and I always felt like I had that freedom um, and that flexibility. And so, you know, I wasn't looking to bring borderline cases where, where this type of thing became an issue. And in most of my cases, uh, maybe all of them, it, it was not. Um, and so again, on that practical level, um, you know, is this affecting that 5% of closed cases and is it really bleeding into that 90 to 95%, um, at least from an ACE perspective that are, that are not, determined in that way. Um, again, the pra- to me, the practical difference may not, may not be as large. Thanks. Okay. So next question from the audience. This is from Ross Stovall. Um, what, if anything, is forthcoming or possible as to Chevron or other case lines that might provide remedies to the Garland overreach? I read this question as, you know, asking, is there, would there be some court remedy if um, the federal government, the executive branch is misusing guidance documents? Well, I, I mean, you know, uh, they could revisit Kaiser, um, first of all. Um, the, the court could certainly do that, revisit Kaiser, revisit any of those matters. Um, you know, theoretically, anyway, uh, if you follow Justice Kagan's opinion, um, part of the check is already still there within within the courts, right? It's ultimately the final decision um, is, is, is up to the court. Um, and, you know, deference to the agency requires a number of steps that Justice Kagan goes through in that opinion. And so, you know, it's certainly not like a court at this point could not apply that analysis in a way that would provide a check in a borderline situation or a situation where where the department and the views of the court, uh, 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 you know, or the agency abused its 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 um, its its privileges under under uh, rulemaking under our. Um, but um, but but I, I mean, my initial reaction is just. I mean, the court can always revisit this. It, it was asked to revisit our and overrule it in Kaiser. It declined to, but that doesn't mean it can't do it later. You know, I'll just add, you know, talking about Chevron versus our deference. I mean, you know, Chevron is typically uh, deference to an authoritative interpretation that is promulgated through notice and comment rulemaking. I believe the court has a case up on the docket this year that may deal with that again. And they always have the opportunity because Chevron comes up all the time. So yes, at any time, I think you could have the Supreme Court revisit Chevron. And of course, if they revisit that sort of derivatively, you think they'll revisit our, uh, you know, my general take on it is, boy, if, if, <laughs> if you, if we couldn't even get the department to take the position that our should go away uh, in the last administration and, and the Supreme Court to take that position, I mean, I think the I think the deference doctrines uh, for better or worse are here to stay. Uh, and so I would not look to the judiciary to rein in the executive in any significant way on the use of guidance documents. And, and, and you know, that was sort of the principle, though, that I talked about at the beginning, nor should it have to. It ought to be that the executive branch is able to control itself uh, and that it is able to put up some of its own guardrails, especially because we have such a vast administrative state now. You know, if the executive branch is going to be uh, delegated so much lawmaking power, it ought to have some of its own internal checks. You know, frankly, that's what the APA is for, at least to some minimal extent. But the problem with guidance is it ignores even the APA. So you lose those checks as well. So, you know, every time there's another sort of overlay, the executive branch moves out of that overlay. And so, you know, this whole thing, this whole project that Reg reform was to try to bring it back to some kind of controlled situation. And I agree with Jesse with regard to Chevron, um, you know, with regard to, to our deference and, and Kaiser, I'm, I'm not quite as sure. Uh, Justice Gorsuch, I believe, referred to Kaiser as a stay of execution. Um, and, and, you know, that I am, I am by no means a Supreme Court expert, but, uh, but I, I tend to think that, that our deference in the, in the, in the medium to, to long term is, is on much shakier ground than, than Chevron deference. Okay, so in the, the last minute, um, I will ask you just for um, a factual question and predictions. So has there been an increase in the issuance of guidance documents since the Garland memo on July 1st of last year? And if not yet, do you think there will be? Please, Jesse. <laughs> well, you know, I won't, I won't claim to have done any empirical uh, analysis. And I think, you know, that kind of analysis, because the, 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 Sessions and brand manual principles, especially once they reduced, were reduced to regulation and, and justice manual provisions were in place for such a short time. 
And that time was interrupted by the pandemic, where, as I said, a lot of those principles sort of <laughs> went out the window for a time in many agencies. It'd probably be impossible to do a good comparison. I think you probably would have needed a longer term. Uh, so I don't know, but I but but I will say, you know, sort of descriptively uh, or, uh, or prescriptively, I guess, I, you know, there's no I, I don't think the current administration is going to feel any uh, more constrained than did the Obama administration in using guidance in uh, announcing programs via blog post or uh, in a speech or, or other means. I just think that is the general orientation of the folks leading the government now. Uh, and that's their their view of how the administrative state should work. Any predictions, Chris? Uh, I, I, I don't I don't see again, I don't have any empirical data, but I, I don't see the the, the amount of, of guidance increasing. Um, you know, I, I I think that, you know, as someone who who kind of saw these things as they came through, I, I didn't see much hesitancy. Um, to issue guidance, you know, at, at any point while I was at, at justice, um, you know, I do think that that agencies have an interest. They may not always get it right, uh, Lord knows, but I do think they have an interest in their in their in their guidance documents being clear and, and public um, in most instances, and, and providing um, proper input to the public. And so, you know, I, I don't expect to see a massive uptick. Great. Well, thank you. Uh, we've reached two o'clock. So I just want to thank uh, Jesse and Chris so much. We had really wonderful panelists. And again, these are the folks who were who were uh, on the ground and in the trenches um, doing this work and, and now responding to this work uh, in private practice. So uh, really wonderful to have you both here. Thank you again. Thank you to the Federalist Society uh, and to everyone else who listened. Have a great afternoon. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thanks all. Uh, on behalf of the Federalist Society, I want to thank our experts uh, for the benefit of their valuable time and expertise today. And I want to thank our audience for joining and participating. Uh, we welcome any uh, further feedback at, by email at info at fed-soc.org. As always, keep an eye on our website for emails and announcements about upcoming webinars. Thank you for joining us today. We are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.